Hello and welcome to this Spotlight Series event, uh, Palliative Home and Community Care During COVID-19, Lessons Learned. I'm Claire Ludwig and I'm pleased to be your host today. And uh, I've been, this is a project that I've been involved with from the very beginning and I'm absolutely thrilled to see uh, the results of this collaborative work come to life. I want to say a special thank you um, to our panelists for your commitment to palliative home care um, and to thank all of you on the call today who have taken the time to join. Uh, I'd like to extend thanks to the partner organizations that have supported and continue to support this work and to all of you um, who so freely gave your time and expertise to inform the Lessons Learned document. I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, that we are meeting on land that uh, has been inhabited by indigenous people since the beginning. In particular, we are broadcasting this webinar from Ottawa, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection to this place and the opportunity to gather here today. We're pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation for this session. And uh, so if you wish to hear the voice of the interpreter, please select French from the interpreta uh, interpretation menu at the bottom of your screen. And uh, as the se session uh, progresses, we invite you to share your questions and comments at any point using um, the chat box and you can post them in either English or French. And uh, we also encourage you to respond to comments and answer questions in the chat as we go along. Please note that the uh, session is being recorded and the recording will be made available to all registrants within the coming week. Um, I also want to point out that should you need tech support at any time during the webinar, you can reach out to one of our tech supports uh, using the chat feature. Um, so now without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, and while I'm doing that, uh, I'd like you to ask that you also uh, take a moment to introduce uh, yourselves in the chat box, but uh, I'll be introducing uh, the speakers. And so uh, joining us today, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Brenda Roberts. Um, Brenda cared for her daughter, um, Kira, while she was receiving palliative care uh, supports at home. Um, Kira died at the age of 25 uh, from ovarian cancer. And uh, during, uh, during her illness, Kira received a number of palliative home care uh, services, including uh, palliative nursing and other supports. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce Jeff Moat. Uh, Jeff is the CEO of uh, Pallium Canada, a national organization focused on building professional and community capacity to improve the quality and accessibility of palliative care across the country. Welcome, Jeff. And uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, now to introduce Dr. Amy Montour. Amy is a physician on the Six Nations Reserve Palliative Care Team and adjunct clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. Amy is also the Regional Aboriginal Clinical Lead for the Jurovinsky Regional Cancer Program and Regional Palliative Care Clinical Co-Lead in the Hamilton, Niagara, Hamil Holdemond and Brant uh, region. Uh, welcome, Amy. And uh, last but not least, um, gives me pleasure, great pleasure to introduce Laurel Gillespie. Laurel is the CEO of the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association, which is responsible for advancing um, and advocating for quality end of life hospice palliative care uh, across Canada. And their work includes public policy, 
public education and uh, raising awareness. So welcome and uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, and today's webinar really is an opportunity uh, for us to share and discuss the report recently release, released. And uh, you can you see the title on the screen here, um, uh, Home and Community-Based Palliative Care, Shaping uh, the Future from Lessons Learned During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And uh, there will be a link posted uh, in the chat box. So this report uh, is the result of uh, just an enormous amount of collaboration um, that took place uh, late last year and uh, over the, the ensuing months. And it's really the result of the collaboration between Healthcare Excellence Canada, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, the Canadian Home Care Association and Health Canada, and was further supported by Pallium Canada and uh, Canadian Virtual Hospice. So you can just see the enormous uh, collaboration that went into the, uh, the development of this. So uh, why did we embark on this work? Um, uh, as most of you uh, on the call know, at the start of the pandemic, the impact on community um, care and on home care and particularly home, uh, palliative home and community care was felt almost immediately. And we needed to better understand the impact to guide future practice, not just in pandemic situations, although that was our immediate focus, but really looking beyond uh, the pandemic. And so for our, for our work and for our analysis, we leveraged an existing framework um, that had been developed by ARIA and colleagues uh, and that was published in um, the Canadian Medical Association uh, Journal. Um, and that work was uh, entitled Pandemic Palliative Care Beyond Ventilators and Saving Lives. And certainly that's really um, uh, shone a focus on the pivotal role that uh, palliative care um, providers um, play in the community. And so to inform our work, we reached out to over 50 key um, informants across Canada in September 2020 to help us better understand what was going on. And we found that home was certainly perceived as the safest place for care, but that undoubtedly led to increased demands, uh, particularly for caregivers. And as with other se sectors, the pandemic amplified existing gaps and inequities to care. Uh, there were many challenges that we identified and outlined in the reports, but also there was substantial innovation and uh, creativity. So the report really gave us the opportunity to understand what happened during that initial wave. Um, and as, as I said, to share and prepare for ongoing pandemic challenges by identifying not only the gaps in access to home and community palliative care, but also to identify promising practices and the innovations that emerged to fill those gaps. Uh, and we also identified ways to leverage partnerships and networks to share what was learned. And if we can move to the next slide. So our analysis um, resulted in this interactive resource that uh, captures over a hundred strategies for improving uh, palliative home and community care. And our hope is really that these strategies can continue to help shape the future um, of palliative home and community care. And we also hope that you'll use it as a valuable resource for your work. Uh, and so there are without doubt other terrific examples of solutions, really creative solutions, innovations that are out there that we weren't able to capture. But the intent really was to start this conversation. And I would encourage those of you on the call today to use the chat box to share those strategies with, uh, with our colleagues on the call. 
And so uh, without further ado, um, and really to get the discussion going, uh, we're going to have a bit of a lightning round. And I'm going to ask each member of the panel in three minutes or slightly less, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us about your experience in palliative home care. And uh, I thought, Brenda, uh, I would uh, just get you to, to start. So if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience in palliative home care. Thanks, Claire, for making me first. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak. My name is Brenda Roberts. Um, I was a parent slash caregiver for my daughter, Kyra. Kyra was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at age 22 um, and died at age 25, uh, two weeks short of for three years. Um, Kyra was in the first six months in and out of hospital between London, Toronto, uh, Detroit. Um, and then Dr. Darren Cargill came on board as a pain management specialist through hospice. Um, and once that happened, things calmed right down. He listened and we got a plan going. We made an amazing team uh, through our home healthcare hospice and uh, our family. And uh, it made a very dramatic difference. Um, it, uh, I promised Kyra that uh, I would continue to uh, advocate for palliative care at home. Um, it was made, I can't even put into words to all of you what a difference it made in our life, how much it uh, meant to her and what it did for her um, in the end. It really um, took a lot of stress. We were allowed to be a family and they actually listened to her and, and her wishes, uh, which I think is communication is key between the team, um, whether it be your home care palliative you know, team out of hospice, whomever's on that team, uh, it's extremely important to have that communication. Thank you, Brenda, uh, for sharing that. And um, Amy, I'd like to uh, turn over to you now and just uh, get you to introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your experience with palliative home and community care. Sego, my name is Amy Montora. I'm Haudenosaunee from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I have training as a nurse as well as a physician, and I have worked in uh, palliative care uh, in the PSW role, the nursing role, as well as the physician role. Um, my practice is a bit different um, than most palliative care specialists. Our team follows patients' community, hospice, and hospital. So generally, we're able to uh, follow them along their journey. And because I am providing care in my home community, I'm often called upon to call to provide care for people who are very close to me. Uh, so it makes it just a little bit different uh, perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And that certainly is just a breadth of experience. I, uh, I'm not sure I've, uh, <laughs> I've ever met anyone that's had that full uh, breadth of uh, from PSW to, uh, to physician. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, Laurel, if you could uh, just introduce yourself and your uh, experience with uh, palliative care. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Laurel Gillespie. Um, I come to this table today uh, with a business background, with an MBA and a CHE uh, hat. Um, but more importantly, I come to the table with, um, you know, as a mother, a partner, a sibling to seven <laughs> others. Uh, and I've been a care at home to a palliative patient two times now. Um, and although both experiences were, one was in the context of COVID and the other one not, the two experiences were very, very different. Um, part of the reason why I became involved in palliative care is I myself was diagnosed 14 years ago with breast cancer and at that time was given a 20% chance of survival for five years. And my twins were nine and my youngest was six. And thankfully through um, great medical care, at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center, I'm still here today, but um, vowed that I would do what I can to ensure that I could advocate for quality palliative care as I had to reflect on what I would want my end of life care to look like. Um, as a carer uh, in the home, I know that my first experience, uh, I cared for someone with Alzheimer's for six and a half years. And it was through community programs, such as being able to use respite services and having PSWs come in to assist, 
that I would not have been able to uh, provide that level of care and have those family experiences if it had not been for those uh, pivotal uh, services that were available. The second time around, um, more recently, um, palliative uh, hospice care was not available where I reside in the Wakefield area in the Gatineau Hills, just outside the National Capital Reason, Region. Um, due to the fact that the local uh, Maison de Calen, the local hospice, had to close its doors on June 20th due to a lack of or a um, shortage of nurses, which was so disheartening because this was coming for quite a while. I'm, I'm thankful to say, though, that uh, death, although it was recent just last Sunday, um, was very peaceful and that the nursing staff knew what they were doing in terms of delivering quality palliative care, and it was very peaceful. And I was also very grateful and to acknowledge that um, we were able to be by bedside, which has been unusual this past year um, and a bit. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, that the experiences, although they were very different, um, both, uh, both times and both go arounds were, were very positive, only largely due, I think, because of the level of, of services that were available, but I think that's changed not only um, that over the past uh, you know, 11 years since the first time I lost someone at home, um, that there was more services or that were accessible then than there are today. So I'm committed to trying to improve that uh, so that everybody can have as good an experience as my family has. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurel, for sharing that. Um, just that, uh, just also your, uh, your personal uh, your personal story uh, with us, um, both of your own uh, diagnosis as well as your experience. Um, and uh, Jeff, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Mote. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada, and my connection to palliative care, like uh, many of my fellow panelists, is both on a professional and a personal front. So as CEO, of course, I provide uh, oversight and direction to the organization. Um, and as, as was described earlier, uh, Pallium's role is really uh, one where we uh, develop capacity building programs, quality improvement initiatives that uh, strengthen performance and empower more people to embrace the palliative care approach and, and accelerate, accelerate the integration of palliative care across uh, systems um, and in communities. Uh, so in, on, that's on the professional front. On the personal front, uh, I was a carer to my mom who uh, died from breast cancer about 13 years ago. And uh, unfortunately, she did not have a good death. Um, uh, we were unprepared. Uh, we didn't have um, the right resources, information in place. And, uh, and that was something that, uh, that I've lived with for, for quite some time now. And it was certainly the motivation behind why I joined Pallium so that... Uh, people uh, like my mom and others uh, in those situations uh, would ultimately receive the best possible care uh, early, effectively, and compassionately. So uh, that's what brings me here today. Thanks, Jeff. And, you know, as, uh, as everyone's been talking, I think it, what strikes me is the weaving of the, uh, the personal and the professional here. And, uh, you know, palliative care touches everyone, uh, touches all of our lives in, in some way or another. Um, and now I think what uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of move over to sort of the more um, uh, formal kind of questions uh, and and just get your sense the uh, the panelist sense of um, just what's going on uh, with palliative home and community care, uh, some of the impacts of the pandemic, and then some of the really creative things that have emerged out of that uh, and that's really as well mirroring what the report speaks to and Brenda I know you gave me a hard time about uh, having you speak first last time but uh, I will turn it over to you because I was really touched uh, by some of the things that you were saying uh, about your experience um, with uh, you know nursing Kyra at home and so I'm going to ask you from your perspective um, what are the things that work really well in palliative home care and the things that make the experience of giving and receiving care a, a good one? We talk about a good death a lot, um, but from your experience, what were, the, what were some of the things that, that made it a positive experience? 
I think the biggest thing was that um, Kyra was listened to. Uh, there was a lot of communication, um, and there there were pitfalls. I, I you know it wasn't always it wasn't always a uh, a thousand percent experience, but the most important thing was that she was listened to. Um, what you know when she didn't want to do something or didn't agree with something, uh, there was a team effort to come up with a different solution. Um, it integrated our family, which made a humongous difference uh, because when Kyra was diagnosed, I had a 15 year old at home. Um, so, you know, Kyra had moved out of the house and was living on her own. She moved out in the June and was diagnosed in September. And uh, within things happened very rapidly. Uh, Kyra was diagnosed uh, stage 3C um, and it had metastasized quite a bit throughout the body. They had to do uh, an emergency uh, complete hysterectomy, very radical. Um, so Kyra never went back home. Uh, she moved in with us after the operation and had to give up all of her independence, so to speak. Um, so that was a little bit of a challenge for our family, you know, uh, being kind of empty nesters, so to speak, and then bringing her back home. And, and the um, two things that I learned was not to try and take away her independence, to not step in as a, as a parent um, so quickly and say, well, wait a minute. I had to step back and say, okay, what do you think? You know, how do you feel about this? Um, and that was really tough as a parent to, you know, um, sort of step back and not, not want to, you know, put her in a cocoon and protect everything. Um, but her being 22, you can't do that. Um, we had a great home team in the beginning. It was a little tough, uh, but until we got a, a team that worked um, and Kyra had a lot of challenges. Um, she was allergic to a lot of things. Um, there were a lot of setbacks, um, but, you know, through communication and, and working together as a team and including the family and the doctor, the doctors, it made it uh, a little bit easier. Um, we had doctors in London and Windsor um, who didn't always agree. So that made things a little bit of a challenge. And Kyra was very vocal. Um, if Kyra didn't want to do something, Kyra didn't do what Kyra didn't want to do. Um, she was very open to some things and very close to other things. Um, and it, it being at home and doing things at home uh, made it a lot better for our family. We were able to uh, all pitch in and help. Um, we, I only had nursing care for bandage changes. I did not have any PSW care. So I bathed, I did all the medication at night myself. Um, so there, it was a lot of work uh, and it was hard work. And um, looking back now, I think kind of there were times when maybe I should have spoke up and said, hey, we need extra help, um, but I didn't. Uh, so there, you know, it was a, a learning curve, but it was something that um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change. I totally wholeheartedly believe that if Kyra had been hospitalized um, throughout the process, um, Kyra would have passed away a lot sooner. Being at home, she was more relaxed. Um, things were done differently. There was a lot less stress um, on her on, and on us as a family. Um, we were given more time to digest ideas. Um, and, you know, when medications didn't work, um, having a hospice to call um, being 24 hours was amazing. Um, you know, not having, because in the beginning when I didn't have that 24 hour support of a call, was um, pretty wrenching sometimes, you know, because as we all know, everything doesn't happen between eight and 4.30, it happens after 4.30. Um, so those were some learning curves, you know, learning when to call, when not to call, when to go to emergency, when not to go to emergency. Um, it presented some challenges, uh, you know, but once we got a team that worked with us, it, it really changed a lot of things. We went from, being on a first name basis with the emergency team here um, to actually not going to emergency at all, um, which was fantastic because, you know, when you're going to emergency, that, that panic is there. Is, is she going to catch something? You know, um, we were sat out in waiting rooms with every people that had everything, right? So, you know, you're masked. So wearing a mask to us wasn't something new. 
Um, and I, you know, wholeheartedly believe that once we got that home care team, it changed everything. You know, our, like I said, our emergency room visits went from at least three, three to four a week down to maybe, I think, twice we went in and that was it. So it did make a difference. Um, and having a team of nurses that were consistent, that knew her allergies and knew her um, aches and pains and, and whatever, um, that makes a huge difference when you, you know, because for me as a, as a caregiver parent, I can step back and let them do what they want to, what they need to do versus, you know, somebody new coming in, having to explain everything all the time and, and stuff that, that makes a, a huge difference. So hopefully I kind of answered some things there. Oh, and then some, thank you so much for that, Brenda, and just getting a sense of who Kyra was um, and uh, what was important to Kyra and to you as a family is, uh, I think you, you just spoke to that uh, really beautifully as well as getting to know the team. So thank you for sharing that. Just so that you all know, Kyra died at home. Um, very peacefully. We did have hospice um, care, but her wish was to die at home, which she did. Kyra was the first patient, um, I believe in North America, to um, be sedated at home and pass away at home without having uh, 24 hour nursing care. That's, um, that's quite, uh, quite phenomenal. I mean, not a, uh, not a sort of an area that you want to be a pioneer in, but um, just uh, incredibly important in terms of that full wrap around care. And I've seen a lot uh, just pop up in the chat here, um, just thanking you, uh, Brenda, for, you, for sharing your story and just highlighting the importance. And um, Amy, I saw you vigorously uh, uh, nodding your head in agreement with a lot of the things that Brenda was saying. And I'm just wondering if there's anything you'd like to add. Well, uh, similar to uh, Brenda's experience, um, the, the things that cause barriers, I think, for me and the work that I do in the Indigenous community is the rules. The rules that say family doctor should be doing this, head of doctor should be doing this, oncologist should be doing this, this nursing agency does this, this nursing agency does that. Um, you know, when it's the patient and the family at home, the, the system rules should bend. They should bend to meet the patient where they are and should meet their needs as they define them. Oftentimes as healthcare practitioners, we go in and we say, this is the way it should be done. Instead of saying, this is what I know, what would you like? And can we come up with a plan that works? And, and so I, I applaud Brenda for the work that she did for being able to, to do that heavy lifting for so long. Uh, oftentimes it falls on the families to do a lot of that work, particularly with shortages of PSWs and nurses in the community. Um, but I, I think, you know, if there, there's one, one lesson that I took away uh, from COVID is, um, the rules don't have to be fast and hard. There are ways to uh, adapt the rules to meet, meet the needs of the patient and the family. Thanks for that, Amy. And I'm just wondering, you know, we talk a lot about sort of thinking outside of the box, uh, being flexible with the rules. And I'm just wondering if there's a concrete example that you, that you might share with us um, in your own practice where you've been able to make that happen. Yes, of course. So I, I, I can give you an example. I have permission uh, from the family to share some, some details of the story. Um, we are, our team serves uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous patients, but uh, our team has never been highlighted anywhere as being uh, having a specialty in Indigenous health, even though we do. So it just so happened that I knew a physician from a, from a large uh, city who uh, was also Indigenous, and, and he had been, ca been caring for a patient, and this was right at the start of COVID, who was declining very quickly. And the patient's one wish was to come back towards my territory, where a family was, and to have catch one more fish, and to die with family. 
that was that was the goal. Of course, that call came on a Friday afternoon uh, because it had taken uh, this physician a week to figure out who it was in this territory that he could call upon because the mainstream system didn't identify us. So I, I said, absolutely, uh, just let me know when the patient's coming, our team will pick them up and we'll make sure that things are, are, are done as needed. Unfortunately, uh, the patient came uh, the next day and there was a mix up with uh, home and community care services uh, through the Lynn and arrived in, in our region with nothing except for a bottle of pills. Um, but things were okay until uh, two days later, uh, we got a phone call from the family saying, uh, patient is here. Um, we need some help. Nothing came with him. No orders, no nursing services, nothing. Um, so we said, okay, we can, you know, we don't have to come out and see you to get that started. So we started, our team started those things right away. And we said, we'll be out in the morning. Is there anything you need right now? No, we're doing okay. Unfortunately, things progressed very quickly over the next 24 hours. And as we we're driving to the home the next morning, we got a desperate call from uh, the nurse saying, um, patient is writhing in pain there's nothing here and we don't know what to do patient can no longer swallow when we arrived at the home patient was doubled over the couch um, in a delirium from the pain um, unable to swallow unable to answer our questions and family wasn't quite a lot of distress um, so it was very difficult to even sort of sort out what was going on so uh Fortunately, I work with an excellent um, expert nurse clinician who sort of took charge of the family situation and allowed me to assess, assess the patient. Uh, and we had nothing in the home. And we knew that it would be hours before we could get sub-Q meds and, and equipment into the home, but we needed to do something right away. Um, we were able to uh, assess and find out that the patient had been retaining urine for over 12 hours. Thankfully, the nurse, like most nurses do, have, had a fully catheter hiding <laughs> in a stock of her own and said, I'll be right back. I'll go get the catheter. Um, we had no medications to, to be able to give the, the patient for comfort. The neighbor next door came in and said, you know what, I've got some lorazepam. I said, great, give me the bottle. We made a little paste, put it in the patient's mouth so it could be absorbed. And then all, all the while the nurse is working with the family to explain what is happening because this person is actively dying in front of us. Now, uh, being an indigenous person, uh, it came to the family, oh, this person needs words. They need words to start their journey. And um, I knew in instinctively as an Indigenous person that meant they needed Indigenous words. And I'm not a healer, I'm not a traditional medicine person, so I called somebody who knew what to do. But as it was the start of COVID, all of our traditional medicine practitioners were also sort of laying low at that time. But I found a, a colleague physician of mine who was trained in traditional medicine, and they said, I'll be there as soon as I can. Whatever words you have, those are the words that, that need to be spoken. So once the Ativan started to kick in, the catheter went in, um, patients appeared more comfortable. Uh, I laid on the floor because we didn't have a hospital bed. Uh, patients lying on the floor, I laid on the floor beside the patient and spoke the, word, the Indigenous words that I had to speak to them. And as I spoke the words, uh, breathing slowed, things calmed. And uh, the very next thing I said was, to the partner, uh, please come put your arms around uh, the patient. That is all that this person needs now. And within five minutes that uh, patient started their journey into the next world. And then we were able to come behind them and uh, uh, with our indigenous team, uh, provide uh, cultural specific grief and bereavement support, and which is ongoing for the family until this day. Now, all of that happened almost accidentally. And yet it shouldn't have happened accidentally. There shouldn't be barriers. It doesn't matter if it's Friday at 4 p.m. The system should kick in and it should meet the patient's need. If the patient is moving from region to region, there should be a team receiving and there should be no gap in care. Um, if they need specialized cultural supports, that needs to be available. Um, because not everyone is going to have the same needs at the end of life. We have to meet the patient and the family where they are. And we cannot let rules and jurisdictions get in the way of that. Thank you, Amy, for that uh, incredibly powerful story. And I think it speaks to the uh, notion of just one 
one team working together. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, and maybe Jeff, I'll, I'll turn it to you. I'm wondering whether you saw um, during, um, during the pandemic, whether you saw some of these barriers, um, you know, coming down. So, you know, building on what Amy's been talking about around flexibility and really, you know, moving together rather than moving in silos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, the best example I can point to is the, uh, the flexibility and adaptability that, uh, that took place when it, when it came to providing frontline healthcare workers with information uh, in a timely manner on topic areas uh, that they were seeking information on. So um, it, was, it was these types of questions that were coming to us that prompted the creation of a series of, of webinars that uh, our subject matter expert panelists uh, from across the country had pulled together, whether, whether that was uh, to impart information in a timely way on, on you know, personal protective equipment in the home or you know, uh, shortage of palliative medications during COVID and so on. It was, it was just, it was a way for us to contribute in, in a meaningful and a tangible way to, to get information into the hands of those frontline healthcare professionals because, because they needed it. It just either wasn't available uh, and to be able to have four or five panelists, uh, primarily, you know, palliative care teams, specialist teams uh, that lent their time and expertise to, uh, to share their knowledge and information um, people took a lot and derived a lot from that. So I think that that demonstrates the type of, you know, flexibility, if you will, and the, the just-in-time resources that not just ourselves, but other, other organizations put out there um, to, to really equip people with the information that they, that they desperately needed. And thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff, for that, because I think what that speaks to is more of this, you know, so individual practitioners and organizations needing to flex. And we, we saw that happening um, during the pandemic, but we also saw uh, like large national organizations like Pallium um, flexing and, and really, you know, adapting uh, to, the, to this new world. And so, Laurel, I'll come to you now in terms of uh, just some of the things that uh, that you've seen uh, over the course of the pandemic, some of the innovations um, that have come up, uh, both uh, sort of um, organizationally and how uh, the Canadian um, uh, and how your organization uh, adapted to that. Thank you, Claire. Um, one of the, there's a common thread in here that I see and it's, it's, it's about having essential conversations and people's voices being heard. Um, and I always have a favorite quote to share from Martin Luther King Jr. He once said that your life begins to end the moment that you become silent about the things that matter. And one of the areas that we uh, advocate for is in having essential conversations around advanced care planning. So that in the event that you're not able to speak for yourself, that your wishes, your desires about your care and your autonomy, when you're not able to advocate for yourself are honored and wished, wished or your, on, their wish, your wishes are honored and respected as an individual. Um, and I see that as a common, um, a common thread among some of these discussions is that people were being heard. And there's this, the disconnect that you talked to, Amy. Um, there really, there needs to be a seamless system in place so that, you know, one hand knows what the other hand's doing between a clinical setting and an at-home care setting. And there's, you know, there's a lot of game to be played here in making vast improvements to improve the quality of care. Um, one of the things uh, that I, I would like to say about it is, is it's never too early to start engaging in talking with your loved ones um, and your clinical support team, your family physician about your advanced care plan and expressing and documenting that. And it's really, I think it's the greatest gift that you have love, the greatest gift of love that you could ever give to another person is expressing what those wishes are. Um, I wanted to just kind of, uh, just to highlight something that Brenda, when she was sharing her um, such an amazing story, uh, is that, you know, there's a price to be paid on the caregivers when there's not the right supports put in place at the right time. Um, and in the last year and a half, we moved my mother-in-law to be um, from Nova Scotia. 
the night before the movers came, she ended up being hospitalized. Her furniture, in fact, showed up here before she even got here. because She didn't have a family physician lined up. She had extenuating comorbidities. Um, it was just a mess. Um, but the one thing that we did do with her early on was create her advanced care plan. So when she did pass, we had an idea of what she was willing to tolerate, which made it so much easier on us as a family. So by doing um, that one very simple, um, accessible, free, you know, one of the resources that we provide, it's really a win, 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 win situation. It helps the loved ones and the patients or residents of long-term care facilities, for example. It helps the family's uh, loved ones, the clinical uh, support staff, the, so the healthcare professionals. And it helps the administrators um, who are trying to coordinate these programs um, and uh, reduces the burden. So there's lots of benefits to it. Um, and I, I don't, you know, it's not easy whenever you lose a loved one, but during COVID, there were so many uh, hurdles that we had to overcome and that agility um, was tremendous to see on the ground in accommodating people who uh, quite quickly, I think, felt they wanted to get their loved ones at home where they could protect them and covet them away from COVID. Um, but we still saw, you know, lack of appropriate PPE for professionals trying to get into the home. They were rationed. Um, and, you know, having a discussion about the shortage of medications and the redeployment of human resources to the clinical setting. I mean, there were many pivotal hurdles that had to be overcome. And I think, you know, we did OK, but there's so much more that we can do if we ever find ourselves in this situation. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Laurel. And Laurel, sorry, I um, was a bit uh, unclear when I spoke to your organization. You know, uh, uh, it's the uh, Canadian Hospice uh, Palliative uh, Care Association. So my apologies for that. I think, you know, what you've said is, uh, you know, is really pivotal. And I think there are lots of lessons, uh, lessons learned um, in terms of, the impacts on home care, particularly on palliative home care during the pandemic, the shortages and, uh, you know, whether that's PPE um, or medications. And uh, I'm just wondering um, whether you think the lessons learned from the pandemic, some of the experiences that we've gone through has helped to shine the light on uh, palliative uh, care at home and in the community. And uh, Amy, I'll, I'll turn that question to you to see you know, what, what your opinion is. Do you, do you think that we will, um, as, as a system, take these lessons to heart and, uh, and build from them? Uh, well, I'm, I'm absolutely hopeful that we will. I mean, it's excellent that this information has been collected and now being disseminated. I know certainly when I got the report and I shared it with uh, my local colleagues, they, they were just this ecstatic that this had come out in such a timely way to address these issues. Um, one of the, uh, the system issues are bigger and, and are a lot tougher to, to manage. Uh, the shortage of PSWs, uh, that type of thing is, uh, we, we need to work on that a bit more. Um, we, but there are some good things that have come out of it. Like for instance, um, being able to share the type of stories that I just shared is often what I do in, and when I when I do education. Um, it, when we work with Indigenous uh, people in, in primary care or in medicine, um, oftentimes we think that we can just take the system and put an Indigenous name on it and put it in an Indigenous community. And that, in fact, is, is completely erroneous. And I would, I would wager that for a lot of communities that are not large um, urban centers with tertiary hospitals, that we need to really um, customize the system to make it meet the needs of that community. And, and for some communities, that's building a huge volunteer base that can help with that caregiver um, uh, burden uh, for other communities who are well resourced and uh, uh, health professionals, then let's leverage that. Let's let's sort of teach those levels of primary care knowledge uh, so that a lot of that advanced care planning can be done well in advance. 
Um, but I would say with advanced care planning, we again need to be careful about cultural issues. Uh, so for instance, uh, a lot of the Indigenous folks that I care for, they will die uh, designated full coat. And that's for a lot of reasons, uh, uh, mostly a mistrust of the system itself. And so, uh, you know, we, our team is adaptable. We work around that issue. Um, we know that they don't, they'll say, I don't want to be resuscitated, but they will not refuse, they will not change the code status to DNR. So we make plans and we work around that. Um, and it, it does make some of my non-Indigenous colleagues a little, you know, nervous because, you know, there's a lot of um, accountability for nursing and that type of thing in, in home care. But if we can always remember to put the patient and their families in the center, all of us as healthcare professionals are just little tiny pieces of that story. The bigger story, the most important part of the story is the patients and the families. And so one of the things that I have done uh, to take responsibility in primary care is to really start um, teaching uh, my colleagues about the Indigenous social determinants of health, why they don't trust the healthcare system, why they don't see healthcare in the same way, because that is how we can put Indigenous patients and families first, is to see health and the system through their eyes. And I would recommend that we do that for every single person, not just based on culture, but on where they are, where they live, what they want, what they need. It should be individualized. Thank you, Amy. And and I'm just uh, wondering, from your perspective, what what are ways, um, you know, for those on the call today, um, taking the the lessons that you're sharing here, um, and thinking about how they might embed them, uh, embed those principles in their practice. And and I'm wondering if you've got any suggestions for for that that you could share. Well, I I think Brenda had had the answer. We as healthcare professionals need to listen. We oftentimes we come in a, into a situation and all we do is talk. And and off and if I go into a home, honestly, the the medical advice I give is about five minutes. I can weave all my questions into a conversation. It's about building relationships. Um, I could be the smartest doctor in the whole world, but if the patient and the family have no faith in me, then I'm useless in that situation. Wise words indeed. Uh, and Brenda, I see you uh, vigorously agreeing there and just wondering if there's anything you would like to add to, uh, to Amy's words. Amy's spot on. It, you, have to, you have to have a trust. You have to have the communication and the patient has to be the first priority no matter what. They're the ones that you're there to treat and it's, it's their wishes and their you know, it's their body. You can do every test you want, but at the end of the day, it's, it's how they feel, you know, um, and I can't stress how important, you know, it is to listen, to actually listen, you know, not listen to answer, but listen to hear. Um, and the other thing that I would like to add is that, you know, um, we had the same care, caregiving nurses uh, for almost three years. And um, the same hospice team for almost that length of time as well. And, you know, once Kyra passed away, um, we were just kind of left. You know, there was no, um, everybody checked in the next day, but there was nothing for us. You know, nobody recommended counseling. Nobody, you know, uh, after that first week, we were on our own. And, um, you know, we were very fortunate uh, having that conversation like Amy, uh, or sorry, um, the lady from the hospice in Ottawa there, you brought up um, having a, a plan uh, for, that's, that's a really tough thing to do with a 22 year old. Um, and I can honestly tell you that if it wasn't for Dr. Cargill, uh, I don't know how I would have begun that conversation. Um, and Kyra changed her mind um, she originally was going to go to hospice and then changed her mind and wanted to be at home. And, you know, he did everything in his power to make that happen. But having that conversation is not always easy. And having the guidance to do that as a, a you know, with someone who's got experience to do that. Um, and age plays a factor. Um, we ran into that a lot. Uh, and I don't know if Amy does in, in hers, but 
you know, um, usually it's, it's people that are in their 40s, 50s, you know, but having somebody in their very early 20s and having to have that conversation is, is a challenge. Um, and I can tell you, I wasn't originally okay with Kyra passing away at home. I was kind of like, okay. But at the end of the day, it was about her. It wasn't about me. And it took me a little bit to get over that. But, you know, it's still, your team becomes part of your family. They're in your home. They're with you through the darkest of times and the toughest of challenges. And you can't forget that when that person goes on. You still need to, to check in on the family and make sure the family has resources to, to go on afterwards. You know, um, I think that's, you know, basically, but Amy is right. The patient is the, is the number one priority. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Brenda. And I think you raise um, also a very um, important element um, in terms of grief and bereavement supports. Uh, and that's huge. And it sounds as though, uh, you know, there was a sense of almost like abandonment. Um, you're with a team for three years and um, just the, uh, you know, the ending of that relationship uh, when uh, with, with, Kira, with Kyra's death um, kind of adds another level of grief. And certainly we saw lots of... Um, lots of feedback about the need for improved uh, grief and uh, bereavement supports. And, and Laurel, I'll, maybe I'll turn to you in terms of some of the uh, innovations um, that uh, have come up during the pandemic that, uh, you know, we can, we can bring forward with us into the future. So uh, Laurel, I'll turn to you and then to, uh, to Jeff. Quickly before we move on, Brenda, thank you for acknowledging that those conversations are incredibly difficult um, for anyone, um, especially when it involves younger individuals. And we're, we're doing what we can to advocate for all Canadians that, um, you know, it's never too early, early to talk about what your wishes might be if you're not able to speak for yourself. Um, but it is it is very complicated. Um, some of the innovations we have, so every uh, November, the third Tuesday in November, we have National Grief and Bereavement Day. And each year um, we do a campaign to increase awareness um, and understanding around the, the, important, uh, the importance of grief and bereavement beyond um, a death. And now more than ever, um, these kinds of resources uh, and access to them are, are going to be um, very telling for how we come out of the pandemic. Um, I actually have a good friend who's uh, an emergency medicine doctor, but he's also a disaster management specialist with the Canadian Armed Forces Special Operations. And there's a lot of uh, great conversations that we have um, together about how you help um, large numbers of people go through the grieving process. So we're continually revising and looking at different innovative ways that we can reach people. Because often during that grieving process, people don't know what to say. They don't know how to respond. Um, and they often will just say, you know, how can I help um, without, you know, and then the family doesn't want to, they feel bad saying, okay, well, I need um, because we don't want to be a burden to anyone and asking for help. And, and sometimes, um, you know, that can make all the difference. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's like, you know, it's a, so now what, you know, this has happened now what, and you're just kind of left um, fledgling. And uh, so some of the, you know, the resources that we're continually working on are, are increasing the public education around what palliative care is and isn't, um, what a hospice can do for families beyond just end of life care. It also extends into the grief and bereavement process, which probably is, it's very different when you're actually at a physical hospice um, or in a palliative care unit in the hospital, there's a, um, the communication lines are a bit more clear Whereas out in the community, that's one of the gaps that we've identified that there's just not that synergy or that knowledge um, transference of what is available in your community. Uh, and then, you know, another layer on top of that is the cultural piece 
different cultures grieve differently and it looks and feels differently. And so, you know, we really need to uh, consider all of those factors when we're developing new resources um, around that piece. And I would like to acknowledge that the Canadian Virtual Hospice um, group, they've done a tremendous job with their grief and bereavement resources, um, you know, and another field that's coming, not, not field that's coming up, but another area that's garnering a lot of attention now is um, pediatric uh, palliative care uh, and grief and bereavement supports around that as well. So there's a lot of, of work to be done, but there's tremendous value in the lessons learned as we, we navigate our way through post-COVID and what our new world is going to look like when it comes to delivery of home care and what that can look like. And it's through people like Brenda and, and Amy was sharing your stories that we have an opportunity that we've never really had before to incre increase in the access, not only increase the access, um, but increase the knowledge and the education so that people can know what to expect. And that's where fear is driven out of not knowing. Um, and what we don't know, we often will fear. So when we have, we know what to expect um, and what's available, um, really is very helpful in the healing process. Yeah. I was just going to build on what uh, Laurel was saying there. And, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned Laurel, because I think if you go to mygrief.ca, Canadian virtual hospices, grief resources are fantastic by all means. Uh, mygrief.ca is, is a, is a great resource for, for people uh, that's looking for more information on grief and bereavement. I think the good news here too, is that, you know, a lot of what that Amy and Brenda's talked about are, are teachable skills, right? It's not one of those things where either have it or you don't. You, you can learn them. Um, you can you can take courses, Le LEAP teaches certainly essential conversations. We have modules on serious illness conversations, grief and bereavement as well. So that's the good news here is that we, we all can learn as healthcare professionals uh, to upskill ourselves in these areas. Um, and, and there's one thing that uh, Brenda touched on as well, and it, it just, it got me thinking, um, Brenda, about your comments about you weren't sure if you wanted your your, your daughter to, to die at home. And I, I think it just, it reminded me of, I think it's important to mention that, that, that the home can be a burden. And we oftentimes think that the home is the ideal place, but for some, it's not. And we've heard this from clinicians uh, speaking during our COVID webinars of patients arriving with their family members at, at hospice and they're absolutely exhausted and, and have felt very guilty about bringing their loved one to hospice before this point. But, but for some families, home care can be too big of a burden to bear. And, and, and in some cases it's too costly. So we have to be careful about not placing this expectation on families and, and caregivers uh, that they somehow have failed if they can't care for their family members at home. Jeff, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, for that acknowledgement as well, because um, I think that's so important for for many people to hear. Um, and so, thank you for sharing that. I am uh, aware of the time. Uh, we've just uh, about two more minutes left, um, and. I would just really um, like to thank uh, thank all of the panelists for just these uh, wonderful, uh, very rich um, and engaging stories, um, the, the feedback that you've provided, the, the discussion here. And so I'm hoping um, that, uh, that everyone on the call has found the session um, of benefit and uh, informative, um, but I will, I will wrap up uh, I, um, before, before people sign off though, um, there is a quick poll that we're asking people to, to complete. You can see it uh, pop up on your screen. I intend to share what I learned with others and the webinar provided useful information. So please, this helps with future programming and um, I uh, can now, I'll share the results and it looks as though um, we have 100% uh, yes, intending to share what they learned with others and um, also that the webinar provided very uh, useful information. So um, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Brenda Roberts for sharing her uh, story um, about uh, nursing her daughter Kyra at home. Um, I'd like to thank Jeff Moat from uh, Palladium Canada and uh, Laurel Gillespie from the Cana uh, 
Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. Uh, there's a mental block for me on that. Um, and uh, to uh, thank Dr. Amy Montour uh, for bringing her perspective um, around uh, the um, care of um, Indigenous people. So um, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a great day.